Today we're happy to have Professor Pomeli here today to talk about his research. Uh, Professor Pomeli was born and raised in Germany, and he's got an undergrad. He's, 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 he had an undergrad here at NTU, and he got a master's degree at uh, Jiao Tong University, and then followed by a PhD program at Princeton under the supervision of the renowned cosmologist Jerry Housetrekker. Um, and then he briefly stayed at Harvard for three years as a junior fellow, and then uh, taken on a professorship at the University of Toronto uh, up until now. Um, he was a director for CENA, namely Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, and then he's recently come back to Taiwan to take on the, the directorship position for the IAA and Mexico. On trend as a theorist, Professor Pond is known to develop new tools, both theoretically and observationally, in order to create new research fields. Um, he has a broad interest, he has made fundamental impacts on various fields. For example, uh, pulsar lensing, um, 21 centimeter cosmology, and many other things. Um, if you want to put one line for his research, it will be something like this. He likes to extract and study fundamental physics from astronomical objects that could sometimes appear complicated. I really like this sentence. And I think that just highlights what he's going to talk about today. There's some, uh, I think it's a new theoretical tool, Path the Gross, in order to study interference and interference patterns um, for radio astronomy. Um, and that, I think that will help us to probe gravitational lensing in the future, where a, a future of radio observations is promised a, a sort of a novel probe to the universe. Okay, without any further ado, please welcome Professor Paul Lee. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone. It's great to see when it's old and new. I was a student here, that was 1985. It's been a while now. I don't want to be anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the time, everything seemed very complicated. Things still are very complicated. But you get used to things being complicated. So for any students, um, I, it's, it's a lot of it, uh, I tend to say it's a matter of getting used to theory, not so much understanding and getting used to, uh, to similar phenomena in terms of uh, learning, understanding physics. So in this spirit, today I want to give a bit of our recent research, recent developments, and how that actually goes along, circle back to undergraduate um, physics that I learned. But I was a math student here, which uh, so to me physics was even more foreign than to most of you in this room. And I think it's good to always keep in mind the basics and see how the new and the old, are, you know, that's what physics is all about, finding some things that are actually simple and common and universal. So here I'm going to explain some of what we've been recently doing has been a lot of fun, has a lot of applications, and also has uh, some useful insights into how things so let's just start off with the things that um, I'm sure for all of you here, this is what we have been told is true from day one. It's not a question, and it's just a fact. But in fact, uh, if you just go back and dig a bit deeper, uh, some of these things are, I find, are more interesting than it seems. I mean, not that it wasn't ever uninteresting, but are more interesting than it seems initially. Meaning, in quantum mechanics, we learned that everything is a wave. Now waves have been a lot much longer than quantum mechanics, so this you know this, this doesn't this doesn't seem like a big profound insight since uh, you know we want to lick water waves. These are everywhere waves. You can just everybody knows about waves. Anybody who does not know it about physics still knows about waves. So what's the big deal? Now uh, quantum physics is about the correspondence between waves and particles that you know, we learn, well, sometimes it's a wave, sometimes it's a particle. And what do we mean by that? What is wave? What is particle? You know, can we, and yes, there are books, you know, textbooks and other books full of describing what it is, but I'm going to give a, a interpretation to this that's, uh, that Ed Witten promoted over the last 10 years that is caught on, called picard Lefschetz theory, um, which maps these two things into a um, 
even closer correspondence than um, at least was appreciated in most of the physics community. So uh, it's good to have people like Ed Witten, who, um, who speaks to both mathematicians and physicists. And in um, 2010, he had a beautiful paper where he translated the Picard Lefschetz theory that was developed 100 years ago into modern uh, physical description and uh, has revived an old, uh, an old field. So in mathematics, I guess it often happens that they're essentially ahead of the, with their tools that then get appreciated much later. So uh, what I explain today is how this idea that um, these waves are actually particles is a, is a concise um, statement in uh, Peter Lefschetz's theory. And that leads us to have new tools to, to do astrophysics, to understand fast radio bursts and pulsars, and to use these phenomena to understand our universe. So I'm going to map all, all of this together. And of course, Ed Witten, uh, he, I don't think he is, gets excited about fast radio bursts or pulsars all that much. He uh, views this as a step towards um, developing a, a different um, path to um, compute quantum gravity. I'm going to explain um, how these things, in fact, all uh, are related. We all, the first sweep names, uh, I, expect, I expect everyone in this room is familiar with. Huygens, of course, was the first person who tried to describe how waves work. And uh, I, I still remember this in high school that, yeah, a wave, all that is, is at every point in the wave, it emits a new wave, and you just keep going like that, and you're done. Well, good luck. This is uh, easily said and impossible to do any useful calculation with. So this is one of these statements that are useful and totally useless at the same time. Um, Fermat actually had a had similar concepts. He actually, even though we we think of Fermat's principles as being a geometric optics uh, phenomenon, he actually was was actually working on these wave propagation and, and stationary phase ideas to come up with Fermat's principle of shortest distance. We learned that you know in light takes the shortest distance between two points. That's actually not not true as we know. It's, it takes um, it takes extrema, so it could be the longest distance. You know, it just takes a, a stationary phase. It takes some uh, some derivative, makes some derivative equal to zero. I'm going to explain a bit about how these things relate. Now, um, the, let's go back to Huygens, and of course, what he says is just add up all these waves. So this is often called a oscillatory or Kirchhoff. Um, path integral, so you take a you know, wave, takes all possible paths from A to B, and you just sum them up by the phases. And um, I'll, I'll read a little bit about how this, how this is explained in different pictures. So here we go. Here, um, this is, and of course, uh, Huygens already said that. Um, I think Feynman had a much more uh, modern interpretation that well, particles do the same thing. Right. Particles also take all possible paths, and we think that that's you know, well, it is profound, but it is actually not any different from what Huygens said. It, you know, a wave, a wave does it anyway. So it's a, you only get confused by thinking it's a particle. That this seems like an additional um, insight, when of course a wave always did that. I'm going to elucidate some of the um, distinctions between these two approaches, and it's good to look at the differences to understand the commonalities. So today, I'm going to try to um, convey the concept of imaginary optical images. So we learn in optics about real images. Uh, remember in first year physics, we had uh, you put up mirrors and lenses, and you have to imagine well, what we call, anyways, you have the ideas of, of uh, you know, light takes path, and I'm going to explain how light can take an imaginary path. And uh, a word that, um, is familiar to some of you, perhaps not everyone who doesn't work on this particular technicality, is something called an iconal description of, um, which is a little bit in between geometric and, um, between a geometric description of lines, of particles going along lines, and between waves. And um, this is what I'll be trying to explain 
So I'm going to start off with an optical lensing uh, back on to explain how this works. In a, in a lens, you have uh, some medium. I forgot to bring my lens along. Luckily, I'm wearing some of my, my glasses. So you have a lens that has a refractive index that is uh, variable over space. And then a light ray can um, either go, if, it, if there was no lens, it would go in a straight line towards the observer. And in the presence of a lens, it will it can take another path. It may or may not take another path, depending on what the lens is doing. Uh, now, generally, you can, mix it, you can simplify your life a little bit by taking the um, source to be at infinity. Then you put one less variable. It doesn't affect any um, physical conclusion you make. And um, the thing that matters, of course, to, to calculate these angles, the reflection angles, is the gradient of your lensing potential or the refractive index, depending on what, uh, how you describe your lens. Those two are the same. Good. Now back to the uh, down to the uh, to what, what I said in equations. So this is not the way we normally present it in optics, but that is I'm going to use a notation we use in uh, in field theory in quantum field theory that you have something called an action S, and um, in the case of a wave, you take all possible paths. And of course, the length of the path depends on the distance between the straight line of sight and um, the fiducial path that you are integrating over. And you add to this the lensing potential along the line of sight. You multiply it by the wavelength, multiply by i, exponentiate and integrate over all possible paths the lens could have taken. Now, this integral, if you even if you have no lens, okay, let's let's turn off the lens for a second. This integral, um, you might wonder what this integral does. Let's so integrate e to the, and you're going to integrate this d theta. Right? You're going to integrate e to the i nu theta squared d theta. It's a, you know, you can you learn, you, you know, for that that's the integral of sines and cosines of theta squared. High your oscillatory function. Um, it, it's not entirely obvious that this is mathematically well defined. <laughs> Now, you can do a trick, of course, is that you realize if you take i times nu and call that 1 over sigma squared, this is just a Gaussian integral, and you know the answer. So the, you kind of know the answer by looking it up without worry, if you don't worry too much about whether this infinitely oscillating function has a well-defined mathematical definition, um, you actually can get the answer already just by looking at what you're integrating. Now, the normal procedure of how you come up with Fermat's uh, solution of least action or the shortest path is that you take the stationary points. You differentiate the action with respect to the um, position on the sky, the, length you could have, the path you could have taken, and uh, setting it to zero is the direction in which this oscillation is minimal. It's called this, that's a stationary phase point, and that um, perhaps not surprisingly, gives you um, the, gives you um, solutions that are the classical trajectory. So I think so far this is just standard um, perturbative uh, three-level field theory that's used in the course. You know, the, the solution of the action is the classical mechanics, and uh, you, it's a very complicated thing to get an answer you already know. A few things here to, that this does illustrate, though. So you have some function that you set to zero, and it has solutions that can be real, you can have more than one solution, and you can have imaginary solutions. And you just think about what, that, what does that mean, and we're going to get to that in, uh, in, the, in the next couple of slides. So each of these solutions um, of this classical equation I can ask if life could have gone straight or could have gone to so some other direction and come to you. Um, it, have, it can have multiple solutions, and some of those solutions have real variables, have imaginary, you know, just plug in the equations, you know, some of them are imaginary, and you can ask, should I, should I have worried about them? And normally, in Fermat, that's where I would suspect Fermat did not understand um, how those would contribute. In quantum mechanics, we do understand that. In quantum field theory, so the tunneling solutions that are, that are perfectly good, good solutions and important ones. And um, 
That's why these all stationary images, even in these tunneling pictures, uh, are generally called iconal um, solutions to your action. Okay, so classically allowed, imaginary, let's call them classically forbidden path, um, all have um, all have a, a standard definition. A few more things. So the way this is normally studied, because an arbitrary function can be very complicated, uh, to just get a number out, we normally do what's called a steepest descent around these iconal, they call saddle points, um, is we calculate the curvature at these, at these classical solutions. And um, the curvature tells you the brightness or the, um, the, the value, the weight you should give to that solution. In the case of a real image, an optic, it tells you how bright the image is. In the case of an imaginary action, it tells you how fast it tunnels through an imaginary solution in the case of quantum mechanics. Then, what we, what's much more familiar in classical mechanics is that you only deal with real solutions and you don't worry about the phases. And this geometric optics is the um, thing that, the reason why we're not very familiar with these phases in daily life all that much is that, um, you know, we don't, waves, sure, you see them on the lake, but you don't see them in real life um, all that um, dramatically. And that's because we get the classical limits. Um, well, mathematically, all you've done is you, you give up the phase information and, um, and only take real solutions. So you have to take roughly one quarter of the classical solution. So I just throw away the base and only use the amplitude and um, throw away all the imaginary ones. That's the half of them. Yeah, I'm going to explain why, why I use the number half. But you throw away half the solutions and half of the numbers of those and you use about a quarter of the information content. And that's what we normally experience. What I think when, what I, I like to do when I teach these things is to demonstrate with a coherent light source. This is a green laser. Um, you can buy it on, I think I bought it on eBay, it costs about $10. Mm -hmm. and it's a cheap one because the battery doesn't last very long, so I'm not using it as a pointer here. Coherent light, it's a coherent light source. So, let's do a demonstration on, on the fly. Uh, this up a little bit so it doesn't hit an edge. There we go. Here we go. I've got a green dot on a green um, whiteboard. Not entirely ideal. Let's put it on this green. Here we go. On this projector screen. So this is a coherent light source. And uh, a few obvious things, obvious ways to tell. Um, if you're fortunate or unfortunate, like me, that you're nearsighted, if you take off your glasses, uh, or, and in case you're not nearsighted, you can take somebody else's glasses <laughs> and uh, look at this dot. And what I see, and I, I, see, I see most of you see the same, is sure, it's fuzzy, meaning it's now no longer as small. It now covers a larger area because your eye doesn't focus. Hmm. However, it has substructure in it, and the substructure is still, each one of those speckles is still the original size of the diffraction limit of your eye. Okay, so this is wave optics. Under wave optics, nothing is ever, ever really fuzzy. The information is still there, it forms an interference pattern on your retina. So the wave optics is, you know, this is something that we don't um, normally think about, but it's, it's inevitable, it's, it happens all the time, everywhere. And if you now look at this thing in hindsight more carefully, even with glasses, you can see that there's a bit of a glow around, um, around where it hits. And if I take a, a reflection of it, of the, let's see if I can do this, of the ceiling, um, the main things you can see is that it's always a bit fuzzy, so everything, everything that is under coherent light is always a speckle pattern. Okay? That there are always spots that are brighter and fainter. And whether or not they're brighter and fainter is different for every one of you in the room because you're viewing it from a different angle with a different interference pattern. So I can assure you, every one of you is seeing a different pattern of the same laser pointer. So this is wave, uh, well, this is wave optics. And it's all the, it's on all the time. And the reason we don't notice it very much is two reasons. One is this monochromatic light. If you combine it, of course, with different wavelengths, the pattern will shift. Since your eye 
you know, mix, average is all, the light has multiple colors, you don't see this, and of course the light is an extended source. So there are a couple of geometric optics limits that this is not um, as, as, doesn't drive you home as much as I think it should. By the way, I think if we replaced all these lamps by lasers, by laser diodes instead, um, you'd feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, because everything is would be would be fuzzier suddenly, right? So laser <laughs> it makes things it's it's kind of counterintuitive. I find it counterintuitive, but lasers make things fuzzy. If you turn that off, if you turn off all the lights and only have this laser, you will find everything looks granular and fuzzy because you're seeing an interference pattern and not this smooth average. So you know you get more information by having this smooth average. Just to drive home a little bit about these wave intervals. Imagine I have just an empty light traveling in two dimensions. So I do this, I do this in two dimensions. Um, you have to integrate in this path integral sine of r squared r dr. And you really, like, you know, if, you, if I, give, I give you this problem in first year calculus, you're supposed to answer the, the integral doesn't exist. It just integrates, you know, larger, la larger, larger fluctuations. So this clearly doesn't have a, um, a, a useful um, integral value. Um, that, uh, that, but yet, that's what you're integrating. That's what um, Kirchhoff integral tells you to do, and you're supposed to divide by this integral um, for everything you do. So all these things uh, are, on at face value, a little bit um, it can be a little bit subtle and technical. But of course, it's not. We know how to deal with it, and we, we, I'll get to um, a more general way. And Picard Lefschetz gives a, uh, a much more generic way of interpreting what all of these things do. I'm going to give you a concrete example of a lens in one dimension. I'm going to call this a rational lens, and just because it's a rational function, and it's the simplest rational function that at least I could come up with, or my collaborators could come up with, that um, is well behaved in the sense that it, it drops off at infinity, um, that, that it actually does something non-trivial, um, and that you can actually calculate something about it. So you know, it's a very simple function. Just to recall, the um, images in geometric optics, when you, do, when you take the variation of it, you, you, dif you get to differentiate things. And um, you're supposed to solve the gradients uh, equal, equal, with the gradient equal to the position. Right? You know, if a quadratic term, you differentiate it, you get theta. And you have the, pass, the uh, deflection itself that you integrate. The action is just the sum of phi plus theta squared. And then it's an equal gives you the classical, um, uh, the classical solutions. This is a fifth order equation. You know, you differentiate it out and set it. Anyways, you can convince yourself that this is a fifth order polynomial equation. It has five rules. If you, it turns out, it doesn't matter what you put, any real number of alpha you put in, either one or three of those rules are real. And um, the rest is imaginary. There are always five rules. And the rest come, of course, come in complex conjugate pairs. We all know that from high school or from whatever, from, from algebra. Well, it turns out that, yes, there are always five saddle points. OK, that's, that's the obvious statement of a fifth order of a polynomial has five, exactly five roots. Um, one or three of them we know what to do with. They are the um, images you see through a lens on the sky. So on the lensing, you can do something called an odd image theorem for any continuous potential. You can see, obviously, one image is what you normally see. When you add a lens, it, images come in pairs. So seeing three images is the next simplest thing you might think that can happen. And then well, what about those imaginary? I'm going to first tell you the answer and then why, how it gets there. Perhaps the non-obvious answer is that there is at most one imaginary image. You might have guessed, oh, maybe four or maybe two imaginary images because there was a total of five. Okay, that turned out not to, not to be the right answer. And let's uh, make a picture of what actually happens. So here's uh, the lens lives in theta space. We have a source that moves on the sky um, at constant position, again, in theta. And at a given theta coordinate, no, sorry, it moves in constant in beta. And the theta position is where we see images of my source. 
So if you're far away from the lens, you see exactly one image where the source should have been at the straight line, right? So the place where you see it is the place where it would have been without the lens. As you approach the lens, let's do it over here, there are regions um, like the green line where you see three images, right? There are three theta values for a given beta of the source. And that's pretty straightforward. You can see there are kind of these what we call caustic points where two of the images merge. The brightness of the second derivative um, is the curvature, uh, or one of the curvature, and this is infinity here, the tangent, um, so the, cur the curvature or the slope here at that point is infinity, and you get an infinitely bright image at the A2 um, bold catastrophe. Um, the catastrophe theory one describes what happens when these um, curves collide. Here for illustration, I've shown you what the imaginary image does. So before you have a real image, so with other words, geometric optics doesn't allow to, there to be, you would, you know, here you might say there's only one image. Well, in the wave optics, we already know that the, well, the wave explores all possible paths, even those that are classically forbidden. And there is a station, and you'll encounter other stationary points, and that's, that one of these points is given by the dashed line. Okay, so that's the real component of the imaginary image. Of course, at the point, at the full point itself, these two are continuous, so it's a complex plane. These two images merge and turn into one imaginary image. There's another image, which is this complex conjugate, that turns out not to contribute. You might say that's philosophical, since the complex conjugate, the real part goes the same. But we will see in a minute that this actually is a different um, path. So here is where the imaginary image um, of this lens lives. And in fact, you will see a faint image. It'll be, you know, depending on wavelengths, at short wavelengths, it'll get exponentially faint. And at long wavelengths, you actually see an image over there. Okay, now we get to um, Picard Lefschetz theory to, um, to give the interpretation of what you do with this wave optics integral. And we're saying you're integrating this, uh, you're integrating this action along the real line, in this case, that's theta. So this theta, it, it's a highly oscillatory function. It's kind of hard to tell by something which oscillates a lot of what, what the answer will be. You, know, you might think it's not even clear that it converges. So you have some, something where it's hard to get intuition. Like, you can say, oh, it's infinitely complicated. And the only thing I know is how do you evaluate are these stationary paths. Um, it turns out, um, it peaked out uh, 100 years ago, this gave, gave a straightforward description in any number of dimensions, that you deform your contour, and we're all familiar with deforming contours, uh, to descend um, to, along, to minimize the imaginary component of your action. Then this line, uh, after you keep descending on it and takes a contour along the ridge lines, um, which lines uh, at, at, in, in the mountains in Taiwan, um, they're called Lingxian. That's where you want to hike, because you're guaranteed that no river will cross a ridge line. Okay, you're guaranteed to stay dry if you take a ridge line across the mountains, um, and, that's, uh, and that's what you need. So this line will descend onto the ridge line of the uh, complex, the complex plane. And there will be a number of saddle points that this ridge line will encounter. And those saddle points are extreme of the action. And that's, that's not the bound, but that's the, the you know, just think of uh, if, you have a, if you have a contour, if you're hiking, um, all these things are very intuitive. So, you know, you, along the ridge line, there's no water. And, and at a saddle point, you change your direction from going down to going up, or vice versa. So um, this now now you can already see that because you started off with a, a line along the real axis and deform it, it is true that every extrema of these thimble, they're called thimbles, will be a saddle point. The converse is not true. If you have a saddle point, it doesn't mean a thimble will pass through. So not all saddle points cause contribute to this oscillatory interval. So you, you can be misled. So you might think, oh, I just did WKB in imaginary time. This may or may not give you the right answer. You have to actually ask where my past integral came from to ask whether a given classical or imaginary solution ever actually matters. And usually we just ignore that step. But this can actually be done, um, and this should actually be done 
by deforming a contour and just seeing, you know, we, I mean, this is a statement as to, this is not worrying about encountering some pole or some or singularity, this is just saying that your integral will never reach a certain point. And it also, is once you've settled on the on these thimbles, on these ridge lines, it turns out that the integrand is, um, is provably not oscillating. Okay, the phase is explicitly constant along that contour. And um, this method of steepest descent kind of exploits that fact. But, and then the steepest descent, these symbols have a finite set number of segments, or a discrete number of segments, that um, have constant phase. And that's, of course, a generalization of the um, iconal concept that instead of that each saddle point um, now always corresponds to an image, whether you're in the geometric optics or wave optics. So I can always describe a wave integral as a sum of images. And by, uh, when, when I say sum of images, it's because this integral along this function is not oscillatory, so there is no quantum mechanics. Okay, it's just a number that comes out. And the number may depend on your wavelengths, but it's only a number. So I just get to add images with their correct phases, and that's the same as having some, done some terribly oscillatory pass integral. So it gives you an alternate um, description of what quantum mechanics is. A question? Yes. Does it work in 2D or, or 3D? Or I, I, I will assume it's uh, that 2D stuff. Ah, that's what we learn. That's only us physicists only learn complex variables of one variable, complex analysis and one variable. That's because we don't teach our undergraduates how to do complex analysis in multiple variables, which is why we need Picard and Lefschetz. So they, they did this in any number of variables. So it's always true. So the coordinate can be can exceed uh, two dimensions. Yes. Well, because in this case, a 1D integral becomes a two-dimensional complex plane. A 2D dimension becomes a four-dimensional complex, and so on, and it goes on forever. So, so that's, the, that's why this is not just a first, not just undergraduate textbook. Um, this is very good, very good point, thank you, that this is true in any number of, in any finite number of dimensions. Okay, I think we've gotten very technical here, so let's just show a picture of, uh, of what's going on here. So recall that I had this curve with three regimes, a single image regime, so this is theta along the real axis and imaginary theta along the vertical axis. And along the real axis there's a real intersection point, that's where your image would have been. Right. When you're right centered on the lens, we said there's three solutions, three classical solutions. And um, the contour that oscillates along this line, if you deform it, goes from infinity to a pole, back up to a saddle point, to another pole, and off to infinity. You can see there are um, two, there are two, uh, there's the saddle point, and there are other saddle points that just don't contribute. Okay, there are two more saddle points that uh, have zero weight. So this is the uh, three image solution, then you go on the other side. You can see again a real image, and this is the imaginary image that causes the saddle point purely in the imaginary plane. Remember that iconal takes these curvature at the point only, and in Picard Lefschetz, um, it, uh, it's an extension of iconal that you will place instead of approximating by a, um, it's still a number, but instead of just being the curvature, you have to do the full integral along this curve, but it's a real function you're integrating. Okay, so it's just a, it's still a number. And all it's saying is I just take a kernel and I just have to more, I just, all that wave mechanics ever does is change the weights. It does not change where the images are. The only thing that changes is the amplitudes by wave optics, even in the deep wave optics regime. So it's saying that quantum mechanics is just classical mechanics added with weights that could change. Excuse me, I, from your description of a saddle point or this kind of a land, like a landscape of a functional space, it's all like a 2D uh, concept. But in, in a high dimension, what you really need is a cover, local curvature. Uh, the curvature is uh, 
so like a set a point or or, come, or or like a ball. Um, so in higher dimension, your curvature has uh, many components, and so uh, only in two D, there's only scalar curvature that that you can you can use. Uh, uh, you can describe the way that that, that you do. Is that, is that okay? okay. So, so I think in, in Picard Leffitt, um, the way you describe it in higher dimension, first of all, you put a saddle point, right? So at a saddle point, um, the local second derivatives, there are really two of them along the two axes. One, along, one is along this symbol, yeah. the other one is perpendicular to it. So, this, so the, the, bl black, uh, the blue line, we, could, we call the curve of steepest descent, and this black line is the curve of steepest ascent. So just to go through what um, what you have is multiple dimensions. The one the going up that is, does not enter the iconal. Even the two eigenvalues, only one of them enters in the iconal one. The other one just doesn't matter. It could be large, could be small, it just doesn't matter. It happens to be the same as an opposite sign because of because it's a harmonic function. Now, in multiple dimensions, so in, in fact in this in this paper, um, we describe a bit of, of, of how, what this looks like. We, and within its way, it can describe, of course, what, <laughs> what this looks like in multiple variables, is that you start off with, let's say, in 2D, you're integrating over a surface, and you're deforming the surface in four dimensions, and these saddle points, so these lines become surfaces, and um, you just add up, and of course, at a saddle point, even though it's four dimensions, you only have two directions, both of which are curving down. And your iconal limit is the sum of those two eigenvalues. So and there's no other dimension doesn't count. In any number of dimensions, just add up. Uh, it just number. Of, just sum up the curvatures in this in n, and you're done. Oh, okay. So this is a uh, in, in geometric optics, of course, that's what we what one always does is you calculate the magnification um, tensor at the point of surreal image and take the determinant. And uh, this is just the wave optics limit of how to derive that for a real image. For an imaginary image, we don't normally talk about how this would be done, but it, it is at the end done the same way. Okay. I mean, in quantum mechanics, we do this regularly, but in, in wave optics, um, this, this is not. In fact, I was, ho I was hoping to set up a lens to show you an, an imaginary image but uh, I couldn't get my hands on this quadratic lens uh, in time to actually show you an imaginary image um, on the blackboard. Okay, I think I've explained that in Picard Lefschitz, um, because you get to deform your contour, you get a mapping of one symbol, so one line segment, per stationary point. So it's a way of viewing quantization as um, the classical paths, the classical solutions, added in phase, so it's not instead of having an infinite integral, it's adding up a finite number of, uh, of images, and, um, and that's it. Um, and of course, you have to consider real and imaginary images, if you want to add, if you want, and the imaginary ones correspond to tunneling like interpretations. And the yeah, iconal limit is just a special case, so the specific optics iconal is a special case of the Picard left shifts. But it does give you a alternative description, right? That it says, you know, this, uh, this, this thing that appears to us oscillate and, you know, this whole wave mechanics we're thinking about is just because we, get, we are stuck to this real line. If we, ch if we like to rotate this, the answer would numerically be identical. But now you're talking about a real number along this line. That, in fact, quantum mechanics is just a sum of real trajectories and that, that there is nothing more. Okay, now why is this exciting and why wasn't this already done, why was this not already done 400 years ago when Mr. Huygens and Mr. Fermat, they understood all of that. They never really saw, they never knew, they didn't know that light was a wave, unfortunately. And uh, I think in astronomy, light, light actually is not a wave simply because there's no so there are no sources that are small enough that interference ever happens. So here is a change. Fast radio bursts are the first extragalactic source that is being observed that exhibits um, de facto wave phenomena. So they scintillate, and um, this is uh, measured. So it is only in the last couple of years that there is something for which this matters. 
uh, before, it's beautiful. In fact, if you look at the gravitational lending textbook by Falco, Ehlers, and Schneider, um, they have a chapter on wave optics and lensing, and then they say this is all very amusing, but sadly, very useful, totally useless because it will never be observed, the famous last words. And of course, now we are actually observing these things. So a few uh, amusing facts that normally in cosmology, there's a regime we call weak lensing when you only have one image of a source. So in the universe, we often don't have the luxury of um, putting our lenses where we'd like them to be. Uh, so you may, a typical line of sight has a small amount of perturbation. But we already just showed, even when you have small perturbations, you still have imaginary images because your light took all possible paths. You don't have to, at least in principle, you, you, you don't, don't feel upset that your, your lens wasn't where you wanted it to be because your lights actually went that path anyways. And those are the ima imaginary images corresponding. So you can actually measure time delays in the weak lensing limit. Okay, you can actually measure geometry. So um, as you Dylan um, did, did some quantitative um, calculations now. Of course, these effects are fairly small if you're deep in the geometric optics limit. But uh, for coherent sources, uh, you can actually measure uh, wave effects and get um, time delay. Obviously, your weak lensing means it's still a weak, you know, your noise is still there, but at least it's measurable. Normally, if you take a textbook, it says you just cannot measure it, no matter how much signal noise you have. Even with infinite signal noise, the textbooks normally will tell you there is no time delay, it will never be measured. Whereas here, the answer is it can be measured. It, it may be small because weak lensing is weak, um, but the, everything with weak lensing is weak, so that's not new. So there is new information immediately from uh, being able to use wave optics and doing interference measurement, right? Remember that you really are interfering an imaginary image with a real image and measuring the oscillation against frequency or against time, and that gives you a time delay from an imaginary image. You can do triangulation when you thought this is not possible. Um, there are some other amusing things with the series that I've like, I'm getting very excited about it. I'm getting all my collaborators to calculate um, you know, all the amusing combinations and limits of things. You can measure instant time delay from microlensing. You can detect extragalactic planets. So if anyone who, who gets excited about planets or stars, um, that's definitely part of this. You might be able to measure time delay to nanosecond accuracy in gravitational lensing. Um, if, you take, if you just ask, well, what is the... Um, kind of dimensionless strain that you measure, the gravitational wave detection, uh, or any physics problem really, we ask, well, how well can you measure something coherently? LIGO measures something in 10 minus 20 something, 2, 22, 23. Um, it turns out that a, that a typically lensed um, path, if you just take the path length, which is gigabyte years, and you're measuring the path length difference to centimeters, this is a strain measurement about 10 minus 26. Okay, this is one of the most accurate things. If you think space has quantum form or has other things happening to it, uh, well, you're sensitive to this, and it, if it affects the interference pattern um, at a level bigger than this, you could measure it. And the fact that we see coherent scintillation means that nothing strange is happening at a scale much finer than any other probe that we can readily have along, across um, space time as a whole. So this is a totally new constraint, and much better than LIGO in these units. Now, you can ask, oh, well, I, did you find all your gravitational waves? And the answer is actually, um, there is this, the gravitational wave by being transverse and traceless do not couple to these two paths, or, or these couple the two paths equally. So there is, no, there is no transverse traceless gravitational wave. But it is the best constraint on scalar gravitational waves. So again, it, uh, we had a paper where we you know, plug in, um, if, if you have scalar tensor theory, then that's highly constrained by this because the scalar part will modulate the, um, at this level. So there is no strain fluctuation, and this is more sensitive than LIGO. So you already know that the scalar fluctuations um, in, in gravitational waves is small on this interference measurement, sadly. Sadly, it's expected to be zero, you know. I think, I don't know how many of you like scalar tensor gravity, um, but I think I was never a fan of them, so that's fine with, <laughs> that's fine with me. But, uh, it, you know, it's an effect that could have been there and it's not there. 
he has a wave, for example, of people that it, that the development tools are hoping to get a, um, and some more interesting things. Uh, there is something called a Stokes phenomenon, which is a creation of an imaginary image, because if you find out a way, there's not even an imaginary one. And there is a process by which the contour um, changes topology that um, allows for image creation. This is, uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that uh, I was digging it up um, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, while we were writing these papers. And uh, the reviews didn't really say, oh, this Stokes phenomenon is really only, you know, they have won the, the, they won the casual student trying to read these books saying, this is not for a casual graduate student. You have to spend your life understanding this before you should try to read this text. Only for black belt experts. Actually, it, uh, if you read Witten's paper, that, that, that was all written before 2010. And in Witten's paper, he actually makes it simple. He, uh, I think all of us in this room can read, read Witten's paper and you will know what Stokes phenomena are and how images get created and get destroyed um, without having to spend years studying a very obscure um, uh, analysis uh, subject. Gravitational lensing. And um, here, again, this is that's the fact that suddenly, you know, normally there, there has been, of course, an effort to measure cosmology, the Hubble constant, and dark energy by measuring time delays through multiple image gravitational lenses. And nowadays, uh, to be competitive, you've got to measure to a percent or something, and even though these measurements are getting better, it's been hard to reach that kind of sensitivity. So remember, typically you measure a time delay of, if you're doing really well, you can measure it to a couple of hours. Because you, you need a quasar to vary, you need an echo that's varying, line them up, and you're doing well if there's any fluctuation at all on the hour time scale. Here, of course, you know, instantaneously you get a nanosecond um, time delay measurement, instantaneously. So you're doing already you know, 12 orders of magnitude better than what one normally does in this, in this field. There are other systematics, so it's not, not that as if this instantly will get, give you a, a, a distance measurement. Um, and as you said, you know, the galaxy can move, there are other things that can cause these things. But if you have a fast radio burst that's coherent in gravitational lensing and repeats, then of course from one week to the next, the universe's expansion and everything else um, has changed by much more, by many, many nanoseconds. So these effects become large. Um, on any human time scale. So here's a, um, here's a phenomenon that if we can find it, um, can just change of what we can measure. Okay, I think I've already said most of what have in this slide. Um, I'll show you a little bit of the current applications that have been made of Picard Lefschetz's theory to actual data, to actual interpretation. So um, it's been used in pulsar lensing of plasmas, orbiting pulsars, where we have a, a, at least a repeatable experiment because it's a binary orbit. Um, it's been used, in fact, the place I learned this is from um, the quantum cosmology, uh, the quantum cosmology conference. Um, uh, Lainas, John Lainas uh, gave a talk on Picard Lefschetz theory to solve some of his uh, quantum cosmology problems and listening to it, uh, when I've been trying to you know, deal with wave optics lensing and you know, you get stuck at these ridiculous curve of integrals and yeah, fine, you know, integrating this terrible function even on a computer, it's a pain. Uh, at best a pain and if you have multiple variables like Professor Chur was saying, if you do this even in 2D, a, a highly solitary function is actually numerically very difficult to integrate stably. It oscillates a million times and all your rounding errors kill you. And, and your spacing kills you. It's, it's actually very hard to do. So you know, if you try to do this in Mathematica, it'll just give you, it'll just sit there for three hours and tell you it can't be done. It'll tell you, it'll tell you it diverges because the solitary integrals are just not doable that way. You've got to do something smart. You've got to do Peter Lefschetz rotate it so it doesn't oscillate. And then you get the answer. Um, so that's where I, I, I had this, um, you know, this uh, really helpful insight coming from, so it's good to go to conferences in different fields so you get to hear what, you know, what people, what's happening because at the end of the day, it turns out many of us, we actually so often solving the same fundamental type of problem of, let's say, integrating a wave equation or, uh, or counting images. 
um, it, it can, you know, development in one field can be very helpful. Here is a, a instance of wave optics um, that we saw in a pulsar lensing. So this is a paper from a former student, um, Robert Main, that, um, that we got into nature just because this is the first time we saw wave optics effect in, in the lensing of a pulsar. A bit technical, but it just goes to show that the normal, normally the pulsar has two pulses in a rotational phase, which is for this one is about two milliseconds. And um, as plasma passes in front of it, it's got a companion star that blows the wind. Um, sometimes you see highly magnified pulses. Sometimes you see one optic, one component magnified. Sometimes you see the other component magnified. And you can see spectral structure showing it's, uh, you actually have an interference effect um, happening in the system that these things go in and out of interference. So here's uh, you know, the first, uh, and, and this paper goes through and, and discusses how um, one, how, how to analyze the inverse problem of a wave lensing. For some of you who work on gravitational lensing, you know, there is a, a sophisticated literature of the inverse problem. If you see a lens image, how do you know what the potential was? And yeah, it's something not any problem get this off. Now, if it turns out that this lensing was in wave optics, and um, I think most people would just say, well, let's go home and give up, because it's, it's hard enough to do the geometric optics problem if you add waves. It don't bother. It cannot be done. Well, and if you got left shits, you don't have to give up because you focus, you have reduced it back to a um, geometric optics problem. So there's changes that you can do. I'm going to conclude with a new initiative that um, that uh, several of us in the room and at NTU and elsewhere in Taiwan are working on is to build a new fast radio burst telescope. And for me, the motivation of fast radio bursts are that they are this coherent source of radiation. Right? This is the only extragalactic um, source known that exhibits wave optics. So all these fun things allow you to probe new uh, measurements of space-time that you just couldn't imagine before. You know, 12 orders magnitude better than anything we measured before. And for some metrics, not to say that you achieve it. And the idea is to build a all-sky telescope. You don't know where the next FRB goes off, you're to watch the whole sky all the time. So here's a, um, a way to watch the whole sky. Um, the proposal is to have several, you need several of them to localize where they are. And uh, here is one site that we have surveyed. It's in um, Nanao, on the east coast of Taiwan, um, where we envision what one such a way might um, be able to be constructed. So I think this was the, uh, like, my, my current explanation of some of the fun things that um, that we've been doing, that collaborators have been looking at and thinking about, trying to understand. And it's been a lot of fun because this is real data. You can try to um, you know, fit uh, your integrals to data that you actually have measured. And that these um, data left shifts um, tools, which are the tools that actually weren't known 10 years ago. This is, it's not common that recent discoveries have an immediate application that changes the nature of what you can measure and learn and, and think about. So this has been um, a, a very fun path. I'm happy to talk to anyone interested in hearing more about, um, about the dual description of wave mechanics and um, geometric limits. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Do you need to have a short wave short wave length limit in order to convert the uh, the the problem into a geometrical uh, optics problem? No, that's the beauty of beta left shifts mm -hmm. is that it is always true. And in the geometric optics limit, the iconal limit is when you can use the first derivative at the saddle point, what the chair was saying. The, um, is the, the curvature um, is, is sufficient. And if you are in the wave optics limit, then you have to keep integrating down that symbol. But because the phase is constant, all that the long wavelength does is it changes the amplitude of that contribution. And usually, in a very simple way, it usually reduces that amplitude. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so actually, <laughs> so they have the bits, um, to me at least, counterintuitively, that you, the more wave optics you are like, the more geometric optics you actually are. So formally, as you in the long as you know, H bar becomes large, all those imaginary points stop mattering, only the biggest one matters. Yeah. yeah, so you mentioned that uh, through the fact you talk about uh, actually you can prove the time delay or uh, weak length in time delay. Uh, I just wonder what's the observational signature? So when you if you do the observations, what kind of signature you're looking for in order to do such measurement? So uh, as, a function, as a function of frequency, it's the easier one to see. So in geometric optics, the brightness of your source is independent of frequency and the gravitational lensing. In wave optics, that is not true. Because in wave optics, your wave explore, in fact, wave interferes with another image. So your flux goes up and down as you go up through frequency. And it's this chromatic effect that tells you you're actually looking at, in, at an interference pattern between two images. Do we expect them to see fringes with the interference pattern? Uh, that's right. So uh, they are the fringes between the real and imaginary images. I don't want really, want to get the wrong impression that typically these fringes are um, only order one over order one bandwidths, unless you are in a, very, a fairly special case. So you know, obviously, if you're near caustic and have a strong thing, you, it is possible to have imaginary images which oscillate very strongly. But the generic one is a weak modulation. So it's not, it's not really simple to measure, but at least it's there, where in geometric optics there is just no such signal. So can you elaborate on the uh, dark energy dedication to that time, the uh, visitation or measurement? Yeah, so um, how, how you measure the dark energy under, under this new lensing approach. So um, normally, the way one measures um, distances is you have to do a try, you measure time delays, but to get a distance, you would actually need to know your lens quite precisely, since um, the time delay, if, if, you're, if you have a symmetric lens, the time delay is zero, imagine you're centered then all images will be equidistant from the lens and you have no delay and you have no measurement. So the measurement intrinsically comes because you have an asymmetry in your, in your, in your geometry. For an asymmetry, that means you suddenly have to know what your asymmetry is. Okay, you have to know where your lens actually was. You've got to know a number of things. And the reason um, gravitation, the, point of, the basic limit has been that no, understanding the geometry of the lens has never been totally clean. So the historical limitation is that doing understanding the lens to one percent is not easy to know where think well you know whether you have your odds to one percent all these things are, have been unclear and I think that's where it's been why lensing is not taken as the definitive measurement of the Hubble constant or any other dark energy metric. With um, a, if you measure things to a nanosecond, then the story is different. So instead of taking so instead of using the actual delay, which is sensitive, for which you have to know all of these things, we just look at the change of delay. Okay. For the change of delay, it turns out I can marginalize about all of these things, because I'm actually seeing a Doppler motion. And you say, well, but how do you know? You know, there are a couple of things that cause a differential. One of the universe is expanding, so the delay is changing. Your galaxy is moving, so your delay will also change because of that. But because as long as your ga galaxy is moving, um, on a straight line, so by Newton's second law, the first law, sorry, if it moves by Newton's first law, then it only has two, two degrees of freedom, and with, three ima with four images, it turns out you can measure both the line of sight expansion and the transverse motion um, with just after one repeat of your FRB. And that's because you're, you're only using changes, you're not using the actual delays. So any current instrumentation can do this? Well, I mean, you need, for, for this to be helpful, you need a fast universe to repeat. So right now, there are, I, I don't know that what the official number is, I probably know about more of them than I'm supposed to tell you, but there are, I think, something like, let's say, 10 published repeating FRBs. 
something like one in a couple of thousands sources at, at cosmological distance is, is lens. So you need thousands before you have a realistic chance of seeing one being lens. So right now the odds are very small. Um, even though it, uh, there are more that I'm not going to tell you of how many there are repeating, um, it's still a small number. It's not, not that different from the published um, pool of FRBs. But that's why we're proposing to build a dedicated telescope and then ultimately to find, you know, it's not a question that they don't exist. They almost certainly exist, but you have to find them. And that's why you need a new survey te uh, technique. So when you're making a delay measurement, do you need to include the distribution boson a priori knowledge about the electron density distribution and magnetic field strength in your lens model, or somehow they are just not important, or you can factor them out? OK, so um, it's, uh, is it important? It could be important, depending on the properties of the lens. Mm -hmm. So there have been, it's only a modest amount known of what the plasma properties in a typical gravitational lens would be. Most of them are elliptical galaxies, so they are thought to not have much plasma. So the thought is that there's not much turbulence in them. Most of them are stably stratified. That's observed just empirically. So what, what we know, I would say, I would expect probably not a big issue, probably. Of course, you, you have to measure it to actually know for sure. Mm -hmm. are, and it, you just have to ask, you know, do you have enough observables to um, eliminate that possibility. So I mean, fine, you may measure and you find, oh, there's um, MHD turbulence, and I just don't know, which is fine. I think, I mean, it's not, it's not nice, but it, at least you know. You're worried about that you get a false signal and you'll never know that it's degenerate. And there, I think there is, that risk is not there because plasma is very chromatic. Whereas these things are, um, I mean, I'm gonna call lensing achromatic, and the chromatic effect is only due to wave optics and not due to the plasma change, not, to, not due to plasma dispersion. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it, you will definitely know if it fails. And I think right now, the indication is promising, but of course not guaranteed. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, please. Sure. So what, what, what would this uh, interstellar disturbance or turbulence uh, obstruct your wave feature. What is the... Ah, thank you, thank you. So what does interstellar... So we thought about uh, turbulence in the lens, where the show is asking, and, and they, historically there have been a number of, and I think I may have deleted that slide, of intergalactic turbulence, um, in the intergalactic medium is what you're asking. So neither the source nor in the lens, but just as it goes through the bear, the well, most of the bearing of the course are along the line of sight. And there have been proposals that um, that the observed scattering and fast radio bursts is due to propagation, due to defective scattering of this intergalactic medium. I'm happy to report that um, Dr. Lin, oh, at least in the room. Um, measured FRB 110522, and there's a nature paper that um, proves from that pulsar, the scintillation pattern of the pulsar, that um, at least for that object, there was no intergalactic lensing, plasma lensing. And that's based on, again, uh, I'm happy to go into more details of that, of that paper, but it's uh, from, the, um, from the scattering time dependence of the scintillation pattern that establishes that there was no, no deflection in the IGM. Now, I'm also happy to discuss a separate physics question as to whether or not there should be um, lensing. And um, there have been papers, I mean, at the end of the day, they may be turbulent, but is there enough for it to ever matter to measure anything? And uh, there's the answer, I, I think it's pretty clearly a no, that if you ask, you know, what parameter, what parameter space, what dissipation rate do you need to actually lens, and there have been a number of papers going through that. It's actually, very, in hindsight, of course, you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't look, it shouldn't worry, but both um, empirically, um, we know that for the one that's been studied, and I think there's been a few more studied since then, and none of them have ever shown intergalactic disturbance. Um, and uh, so I think that that part is the least to worry about. Of course, if, if one likes IGM turbulence, it is bad news. What, what do you mean by plasma lensing? You mean uh, the, the, the wave propagate along um, a medi uh, in a medium where it has a dielectric constant and you change, you get the 
the light path get deflected and because of change because of spatial variations in the dielectric process okay. or the refractive index. Uh -huh. And again, you know, the textbooks talk about diffractive and refractive limits. It turns out in Dika Lefschitz, there's only one limit. Any more questions? Well, that's uh, thank uh, Professor Paul. Yeah.